Well, good morning, everybody. I'm excited to get service started. Uh, it's the Christmas season. It's, it's Advent. We're four days in officially. And um, in my communion meditation here in a few, you'll hear like how life's just crazy this time of year. I don't know about you guys, but it, I don't know why. It always is. I don't know how you're entering into this room this morning to, uh, to worship our Father in heaven. For some of you guys, you may be coming in here filled with joy and hope and excitement for the 25th to come. Others of you guys are walking through pain and suffering, you're walking through despair and the loss of a loved one, or just life circumstances aren't adding up to be what you had hoped this time of year. One of the things that I love about our Father is that despite our challenges, our joys and successes in life, His love never changes never wavers, never fails, and is with us at all times. In worship, we have the opportunity to lift our voice as one, as an offering to him. And I figure what better way to do that today than recognize that his love is faithful. Would you guys stand with me as we recite some scripture this morning together? The underlying section is what I'll have you read with me as a promise and as a testament to his faithfulness. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. May his love endure forever in your day today, the days to come and the weeks to be as we lean into Christmas, this season of joy and understanding that the King of Kings was brought to us so that we would know the fullness of God's love. Would you continue in singing and worship today? Good morning, everybody. Let's sing this together. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing.
scripture from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his governance and of peace there will be no end. It's so powerful to hear that this promise that was made was kept through such humble beginnings. Let's fix our eyes on him this morning and sing this out together. Death could not hold you, the veil tore be.
God, we glorify your name. We thank you that we have been invited into your presence today. We wanna to take a moment to just honor you, God. Lord, I thank you for the privilege it is to be in this place and to bring blessing to your name, God. Lord, I pray during this holiday season, God, I know that there are people in this room who are dealing with a heartache, they're dealing with pain, dealing with sickness, despair, God. Lord, I pray that today you would remind us that over 2,000 years ago, you came to earth to be our Emmanuel, our God with us. Lord, make that real to each person today in this place. Show your tangible hand, God, that you are Emmanuel, you are God with us, that God, you go before us, you're behind us, you hem us in on either side. Everything we walk through, God, we do not have to walk alone because you are our Emmanuel. So God, I pray for hope today in this place where there was formerly despair, that we would not leave this place the same, that we would leave knowing that you're all around us. You are our very next breath, God. You are Emmanuel. You're God with us. God, you are for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We bless and honor your name in this place today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. While you're there. As I uh, alluded to earlier this morning, there's something about this season that makes me feel like day in and day out I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Is anybody in that as well? A couple hands. The uh, Advent is among us, meaning uh, our, our King of Kings is to be born, and we are to celebrate that on the 25th of December. And it's funny, because I feel like this time of year, somebody is hitting fast forward on my life, as if I've given somebody else permission to say yes to things on my calendar, and in all reality, it's me that does that. You have uh, Christmas party after Christmas party, the uh, everybody's favorite uh, work gathering Christmas party, wink, wink. You've got Elf on the Shelf locations you got to think about, and the Santa Claus visits, and then the gingerbread house making, and then all of the other things in between that tell us what a successful season looks like. Societally, we're taught to hurry off to the stores, to spend money, to save money, to get the best deals. Our, our pace of life ends up picking up, and it gets crazy, and we forget to pause in a world of hurry to understand what's coming. The cool part about Jesus' ministry and life is it never involved hurry. I spoke really early on in this year about the idea of Jesus' pace of life is that he walked everywhere and wanted us to walk with him in that invitation. Hurry has this weird thing that it does to the soul where it affects us in ways that we desire to grow closer and in closeness with God. If you will, I've got four quick areas. The first one is this, is that we want a deeper relationship with the Father and with others. Hurry makes those relationships suffer so we don't have time for it. We want to contemplate Scripture and understand the Word more during our quiet times, but hurry makes that almost impossible when we can't give it time. We want to be more productive and produce meaningful work when we're there, but hurry steals excellency. And finally, we want to serve others well, but hurry causes us to fail with empathy. We can't truly love the Ville well when we hurry along and, and forget to look at people in the eyes. 
You see, hurry was not a part of Jesus' ministry. It wasn't a part of him being carried for nine months. It wasn't a part of him being in the synagogues and learning the Torah by memory. It wasn't him walking through the crowds being stopped and touched by people. It wasn't him stopping to ask, who touched me when the woman was bleeding and would soon to become healed. It wasn't him sitting in the garden praying that if his will would be done, not having to die on the cross. It wasn't hurry when it took him three full days to resurrect. This season, we have the opportunity to slow down and 21 more days therein to reflect on the coming of Jesus. And today through communion, we celebrate in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, this simplicity. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. And it's through communion today that we celebrate that. Would you take the bread with me in remembrance of the body that was broken? And the juice in remembrance of the blood that was shed. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning expectant to be changed by your word, expectant to be changed by your sacrifice. God, help us slow down in our life throughout this next 21 days so that we would understand and truly know that you are Emmanuel, God with us. That through your son dying on the cross and raising three days later, we would know the fullness of your love that endures forever. God, thank you for your son, for the greatest gift of all time. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, with Christmas season among us, would you direct your attention to the screens? No, we don't need to do it again. <laughs> Isn't that what we all want for Christmas? You know, the Marshall Brothers by a far fireplace. Oh. Hey, you can probably already tell with my voice, um, I have been subjected to the Christmas gift that just keeps on giving here in Louisville, um, the flu. <laughs> uh, and like it's, it's probably like Friday-ish where I started filling it, which is just a little too late in the week to hand the baton to somebody else. I'm like, like ibuprofen, coffee, we'll get through it. So uh, round three here, it's gone well so far. Uh, you know, God used five loaves and two, piece, or two, two fish, right? You know, got a job done, so we'll, we'll get it done this morning. Um, be gracious with me. Uh, Luke chapter one, verse 39, you can turn in your Bibles there. Luke one thirty nine. As you do, uh, speaking of Christmas, on your way out today, you'll see. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You'll see these little uh, postcards at the door. Uh, these postcards are awesome because one on one side of it, it's got all of the Christmas Eve service times. Uh, you know, we've got a service on the twenty second, a service on the twenty third, four on the twenty fourth this year, and it has uh, the services that will be ASL interpreted, also marked on there uh, for those of you interested in that. So take one of these home for you, but also take a couple of these home for the people that you might invite this Christmas. Lots of people out there right now are looking for Jesus. They're looking for something more than this in life. And Christmas is always just a great opportunity to welcome them into an environment that's safe, that's fun, and that will also introduce them to the greatest story ever told. All right. So what you'll see on this little postcard is that there's the service times. And what you can do is you can circle or check off the one that you're going to and then write your friend a note. You know, write your neighbor a note, write the person who's at your you know, office comp or at your work a note, write that family member a note and say, hey, I'm going to this service. I would love for you to, you to come with me. You'll be surprised. You'd be surprised how many people might come along with church with you. So there's your Christmas Eve challenge, all right? Uh, grab, grab one of these and invite somebody along. Now, as you'll see on the slide there, uh, we've got a couple other important dates. 
through the Christmas season to just bring to your attention. Of course, there's Christmas Eve services. Then again this year, um, like we, this will be the second annual, uh, like we did last year, we're, we're gonna do a New Year's Eve prayer service right here in this room. Um, 11.30 p.m. is when we will start. Who, who came to that last year, by the way? Just by a show of hands. Yeah, so several people, this was crazy, there's over 200 people at 11.30 p.m. in this room just to pray for our church and ask his blessing over our church going into the new year. So uh, if you've got no other plans or if you just like to spend your, your new year's praying it in with your church family, I would welcome you to join us. I'll be here um, and uh, at 11.30 to 1215 We'll sing a couple songs, read a couple verses, toast in the new year as a, as a church family. And then New Year's Day is the next day, uh, January 1st, which is a Sunday. And we're only gonna have one service that day. Okay, one, be this one. All right, I already told the 9 a.m. service, y'all weren't gonna be up at 9 a.m. anyways on January 1st. So one big happy family. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll pack the room, it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, again, we'll pray in the new year and ask God's blessing over our church as we move into 2023. Cool? All right, you got the dates. Don't say I didn't tell you, tell you so. Now, um, on that note, okay, Christmas, Christmas. Merry Christmas. December's here. Advent is here. Merry Christmas. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've been exploring throughout this series, I don't know if you noticed, is sort of the special attention that God gives to the poor and the marginalized. And I believe few parts of the scripture illustrate this better than Christmas, the Christmas story. Do you recall, by the way, the stars of the first Christmas story? Uh, well, first, of course, there's the poor. The poor are called on to star in the show because Jesus' mother and father earthly father. Mary and Joseph are both poor. Joseph is a construction worker. Mary is a poor teenage girl. They come from a hick town part of the region of Galilee. They offer the poor person sacrifice at Jesus' birth, dedication to the temple. They're po, y'all, po. And they weren't beggar level, but they were certainly living day to day. Know who else was invited to star in the show? The shamed shamed because you see if you look at Luke's story Elizabeth serves as Mary's counterpart right Elizabeth is an old lady she's barren and this was a great point of shame for women during this time her husband Zachariah is an ordinary priest but she gives birth to John the Baptist Jesus' hype man it wasn't a virgin birth but it was a miracle nonetheless Know who else was invited the first Christmas? The ethnically marginalized. Now, we call them wise, man, uh, wise men, but I don't think it's a good translation of the word. I point this out every year because it's worth pointing out. The Greek word underneath the wise men is the Greek word magos, magos. It's used elsewhere in the LXX Old Testament, later in the New Testament. It is not used to talk about somebody who's wise. Okay, it's, it means something more like a, like a practitioner of the dark arts. If you, in, in a Harry Potter world, it's a wizard. That's what they were. They're wizards, okay? They're wizards. So when you think of the major scene, don't think of like Santa and Buddy the Elf showing up. Okay, this is more like Darth Vader, Voldemort, and the White Witch of Narnia showing up at the manger. And yet, I want you to think about this. God sends a prophecy out east and puts a star in the sky to bring these ethnic outsiders to the manger, Interesting, right? You know who else was invited? <clears throat> the social outcast. We call them shepherds. They were dirty, considered by some to be untrustworthy, yet God puts an angelic choir in the sky for, uh, for them to ensure that they met Jesus on that first Christmas day. D don't you see? Don't you see? The cast of the greatest story ever told. Who does God choose to be his guardians and his first guests? Who does God choose to be his first worshipers and his womb? Well, he chooses the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. And this was as astounding to people back then as it is to us today. Understand, look at Mary. Uh, she was astounded. God chose this poor teenage girl 
to raise Jesus. Scholars agree that Mary was somewhere between 13 to 16 years old when she receives this message from Gabriel that she'll bear the Christ child. That's around eighth to 10th grade, to put it into context for you, young folks. That's the age of betrothal in this culture. And I want you to listen to how middle school Mary processes her chosenness as the mother of God. Uh, you find it in Luke chapter one, verse 39, Luke 139. If you have your Bibles again, you can turn there. Let's read this passage together. Um, Luke 139, so this is right after the news from Gabriel. It says that Mary set out. As soon as he gives her the message, you are gonna bear Jesus. It says Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. <coughs> now, a quick pause here. I want you to first notice that Mary went out with haste. With haste. Uh, it means that immediately she left. Immediately she went out. Likely before sharing the news of Gabriel with her parents or with Joseph, she first goes to meet with Elizabeth. Why? Well, because Elizabeth might be the only person on the planet Earth who believes her story. It's a virgin birth, I promise. <laughs> See, Elizabeth knows about miraculous babies in that moment. She's also family for Mary, so Mary knows that she'll find a welcome ear. Now, Mary has to go 70 to 80 miles to get to Elizabeth, though. And let me remind you, middle school Mary here is what, she's 15, she's 14, and she's in her first trimester. Show of hands, anyone ever been in their first trimester before? Okay, I haven't, of course. Um, but I've gotten to watch my wife go through it three times with all three of our kids, and that can be an uncomfortable time say the least, sickness, fatigue, all, all sorts of stuff. I, I can, it's all, it can also be a strange time. Um, I remember Lindsay demanding uh, orange juice, lots and lots, copious amounts of orange, specifically Sunny D. We'd been, we've been married for 11 years. She's never asked for Sunny D. But for some reason, first trimester, like clockwork, every kid go to the grocery store, get, to, get all the sunny D. And I'm like, what is, what's going on? She also stopped like in Chipotle, which was very hurtful. <laughs> I, I mean, eat your carnitas outside until we have this baby, you know, but um, we love Chipotle, babe. I don't know what's going on. But um, anyway, so this is what you got here. Now, when Mary arrives, verse 41, it says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. In verse 46, it says that Mary sang. She sang, and I just wanna pause real quick. It's worth noting, uh, if you've never let, uh, read Luke's Christmas story, that it's just one big musical. It's a musical, like there's a little bit of action and then there's a song. There's a little bit of action, there's a song. There's three or four songs by my best count. And okay, it's not like a Les Mis sort of musical where every single word is sung and eventually you're like, can Hugh Jackman not sing for a minute? But it's, it's like, it's a good musical, it's great. Uh, and this particular song that Mary sings has been immortalized, if you will, with the Latin word magnificat. And what is often forgotten in this song is that this is a proclamation of justice, God's preferential love for the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. I'll read it to you, starting in verse 46, Mary sings, my soul magnifies. That's where the word magnificat comes from, by the way, the Latin word for magnifies. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. 
for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now, if you remember many years ago, we used to perform an operatic version of this in our Christmas Eve program. And every year I wept because it's beautiful. Um, So today, in order to help you feel this moment, I've actually asked one of our worship leaders, Lindsay, to perform the Magnificat for us. Uh, it's probably important to point out here. We got a lot of a lot of new people. If you don't know, Lindsay's my wife. <laughs> Very proud of that. Uh, there, there's a, there's actually one. It's it's important for people to know this. There's been a couple times where people are like that's a weird relationship between the pastor and the worship. There's one time like, we were out in the lobby. I kid you not. And I like uh, put my arm around her waist, and somebody was like, "Whoa." <laughs> What kind of church is this, right? And they like told us about it later. They were a little freaked out about what's the case. So anyways, that's my, she's, that's my girl, ride or die, you know. You should just know that. Now, um, she performed the song beautifully. Uh, 
But this, here's what I think. I think that the soft, sweet, operatic presentation of the song actually misses a key point in the tone and the messaging of Mary's original song. See, the theme of Mary's Magnificat is kingdom justice. And one of the tragedies of how the song's been arranged is that in its beauty, we've lost the revolutionary zeal. I wonder if instead of being sung, it should actually be shouted through a megaphone. Magnificat, Magnificat. See, for those of you who don't see it, I want you to imagine Mary gathering all the powers that be of her time before her and, uh, and announcing to them the coming of the baby in her womb. Imagine if she invited the corrupt and hypocritical religious establishment and uh, Herod, the so-called great, and Caesar, who thought he was the son of God. Imagine if she welcomed them into her audience and then... 15-year-old Mary walked on stage with baby bump, and she said this to them. Uh, to Caesar, <clears throat> he will bring down the powerful from their thrones and lift up the lowly. God is my savior. To Herod, the hungry will be filled with good things, but the rich will be sent away empty. The mighty one has done great things for me not Herod, the so-called great. To the religious establishment, he has looked at me with favor. The lowly servant girl will be blessed for generations. And to all of you, his mercy is only for those who fear him. The Lord will scatter those whose hearts are proud. Now look, you can't say that. You can't say that to tyrants. Cries for justice are treason to an autocrat or to a despot, but Mary does not care because there was a kingdom and it was beginning in her little brown belly and it was greater than the kingdom of Rome and greater than the kingdom of empty religion. It was the kingdom of God. And Jesus was the king. Now, fun fact for you, did you know that in the past century, at least three different countries have actually outlawed the public recitation of the Magnificat of Mary? And do you know why? Too subversive. Too subversive for the poor to have access to. During the British rule of India, it was prohibited from being sung in church because it was too energizing to the poor. In the 1980s, the Guatemalan government discovered Mary's words about God's preferential love for the poor provoked revolutionary zeal and outbursts among them, so they banned it. Similarly, Argentina outlawed public displays of the song after many of the mothers whose children disappeared during the dirty war of the 70s started placing the words of the Magnificat on posters throughout the Capitol Plaza. So you see, okay, why? Why is this song so threatening? Why is, it, why is this Christmas song so threatening to the powers that be? Well, the reason why is because its message was clear to the poor. Now, unfortunately, uh, all that having been said, Next slide here. This is how Mary has been immortalized. The blessed mother is soft and sweet, tender and thin, somber face, lipstick, standing on a bed of roses, shining soft light, crowned with stars, also white. <clears throat> First Middle Eastern girl maybe ever to be white. But there she is, white, skinned. Huh. See, that's not the, the faithful, revolutionary artist I believe is immortalized in this song. And might I suggest that this depiction of one of the great biblical heroines actually serves to oppress women today by ordaining passivity and quietness as godly female traits rather than activism, courage, and justice. You see, I want you to reflect on this for a second. This is how Christianity began according to Luke's version of the story, and we only have two, with God choosing the poor. 
Now, later on, as the church gets under its way, uh, James, Jesus' brother, uh, writes this. Apparently, a congregation that he's writing to is having some worship wars between the rich and the poor among them. And so James tries to clean it up. James 2, verse 1. Uh, James writes, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, uh, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who's poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or you sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Let me read that again. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Now, what does that even mean? Hasn't God chosen the poor? Does that mean that it's, it's impossible for a rich person to be saved? Of course not. There are rich Christians all over the New Testament. They play an important role. But I believe here that James is simply acknowledging the special attention God gives to the poor and also the special reception the poor give to God. See, one of the historical realities of Christianity is that it has always been most successful, not only successful, but most successful among the poor and the marginalized. Because the underlying message is just especially empowering to them. I want you to imagine for a second that you were living in poverty today, like living in squalor. You can't make enough money to, to feed your kids. Uh, in fact, the unemployment that the government will provide for you actually pay you more than your minimum wage job. But then also criminal activity will pay you even more than that. So you're just kind of stuck, you're trapped. And your kids gotta eat. You don't have the resources to move them out of a broken educational system. You don't have the relationships to get external support. You don't have access to the same healthcare options that people who live like a mile or two away do. Uh, your government really doesn't actually care about you. They say, they say they care about you. They love to pay lip service to you and how much they love you and care for you whenever they're trying to get votes, but they don't. And then the rich people, they don't even hide their disdain. They think the reason why you're, you're poor is because you're a bunch of criminals or, or because you're lazy and you won't try hard enough. But poverty is a choice, they say. Then on top of that, I want you to imagine that everything that is most celebrated in your country has to do with wealth and fame. If you are a celebrity, if you have money, if you live in luxury, this is what signals to the world that you're worthy of dignity and that you have competency as a human being. The less wealth and fame you have, the more invisible that you are. Imagine that's your life for a second. Then imagine someone shares the gospel with you. Hey, the God of the universe, he sees you. He loves you. As much as he loves anyone, he loves you. And he died for you. And he wants to put his spirit inside of you and use your gifts. Yes, in his eyes, you have gifts. He wants to use your gifts to transform your community. You are an eternally significant being to him and you can make an eternally significant impact for him. He sees that in you. And one day, by the way, this God's gonna come back and he's gonna put this whole world to rights and justice will prevail and the oppressors will get theirs. Don't you worry. And you will live in abundance with him forever. Do you understand why this message is so compelling to the poor? <laughs> now, quick diagram for you. I've shown it to you before. So it's worth showing again. Do Dr. Gina Zerlo, she's co-director for the study of global Christianity, put together a representation of what global Christianity would look like if we could sum it up in 100 Christians. 
right? You should Google this later because there's so much more information on here that I don't know, I find fascinating that you might as well. Brief summary though, there are 2.5 billion Christians. So if there were 100 proportionally, uh, this is what she reports. She says 26 would live in Africa, 24 would live in uh, Latin America, 23 in Europe, 15 in Asia, 11 in North America. 16 would be Spanish speaking, 10 English speaking, eight Portuguese, five Russian and three Mandarin. Only 19 would live in highly developed countries, which means 81 of our brothers and sisters in Christ do not live like us. Only 21 live in low corruption countries, which means 79 of our brothers and sisters in Christ struggle in governments who are corrupt. 18 live on less than $10 a day. Uh, 63 live somewhere between 10 to $100 a day. That's 81 people living on less than $100 a day. Uh, So in summary, they conclude, uh, a typical Christian today is a non-white woman living in the global south, non-English speaking, probably Spanish, with lower than average levels of income, societal safety, and health care. The body of Christ. Today, the great majority of people who name the name of Christ are poor. Past and present, our brothers and sisters are poor. One day when we get to heaven, most of the people we meet there will have been poor in their time. This has always been the case. There's so much attention, by the way, given today to what the poor needs. You know what history tells us? History tells us that from the perspective of the poor, Christianity is one of the things they believe they need most. Hmm. Now, okay, thanks for the history lesson, Tyler. As always, what does this have anything to do with me? Well, I believe this teaches us two things, y'all. Two things. The first, to name the obvious, is this. One, we learn that to be godly is to give special attention to the poor. Back to James, James chapter two, verse 14. James says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, "Uh, goodbye, have a good day. Be warm and well-fed. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. It's funny, I used to have a New Testament professor who would end all of his classes on Jesus by looking at the students and saying, goodbye, farewell, be warm and well-fed, and then he would leave the class. And it was a snarky to remind, a reminder of what faith looks like as they leave class. See, scripture is absolute on this. We talked about this in week one of the series. Uh, there are so many so-called justice warriors out there today, and also Christians, who pretend to care about the poor. They're usually really loud on social media, but that's it. It's a thin commitment to justice because they aren't giving away more than one to 2% of their money to the poor. That's, That's what the national statistics show us. They rarely, if ever, volunteer, but on the rare occasion they do, it's going all over the gram. So you know what they believe. It's a thin sense of justice. They can't name one refugee in this city. They can't tell you one nonprofit that they have been praying for regularly. They can't tell you one homeless person they've put in a house. Their passion for justice doesn't actually lead to any real self-denial. And this is exactly what James is just slamming here. He's slamming it, virtue signaling. So if you say you're a Christian, but then you're like, yeah, be warm and well-fed and you do nothing, Your faith is fake, it's dead, it's useless. So look, at Northeast, 
We are committed to making sure that your faith is not dead. And that is why every year we do you the favor of the Love the Ville Outreach offering. You see what I did there? And for a month, we fundraise like mad men and mad women. Even if we got the flu, I'm like, I got to preach this. We got $2 million to get, God. <laughs> I'll tell you what you give over the course of the next month. It goes primarily to the poor in our city and around the world over the next year. And let me add a little texture to this. Uh, we have so many partners that at this point, it would take forever to lay them all out. I remember, you guys have been here for a while, five or six years ago when we would do our Love the Ville sermons during Christmas time, um, I would put on the screen behind us a list of all of our partners. And I'd be like, let me tell you about our partners. And we had time to do that. It's too big now. We just, it's like, it's too big. So uh, let me kind of summarize all of the partners that we have by describing for you the two kinds of work that they do. They engage in relief work and development work. Relief and development. What's the difference? Well, um, relief, first and foremost, is uh, direct aid needed to meet often life-threatening needs. Um, and at Northeast, every year we put aside money uh, to not only support nonprofits that engage in relief work, but also to come through when disaster relief is needed in our country and around the world. Um, at the end of 2021, we were able to come through for Western Kentucky. This year in 2020, we were able to come through for Eastern Kentucky when the floods hit. Both cases, we were able to provide thousands of dollars thanks to your generosity. You know, one of my favorite stories of relief during this time was uh, one that our worship team pulled off. So uh, there was a church in Jackson, Kentucky. I'm not sure if we, I think Jason might have shared this story once, I'm not sure, but um, they reached out to 70 different churches they told us for help. Their church was flooded, all their instruments were gone, and, uh, and Northeast was, was the only church to reach back out. Um, our worship team said, we'd like to help you. They stepped up, they raised around $2,000. We matched that out of the Love the Ville outreach fund, and, uh, and then we were able to take them gift cards and also new instruments. I remember Jason, and Lindsay and Corbin went down there. Jason preached. Lindsay and Corbin led worship for him. We believe we have a video of it. And uh, they were just so thrilled to have brothers and sisters in their state that cared. My wife told me that Loretta, their pianist, just uh, cried over the new, new keyboard that she got. She kept saying to Lindsay over and over, I love you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. So on behalf of Loretta, the pianist, let me just tell you all today, you are so beloved by people in this city and across this state. Thank you for your generosity. Now, that's relief work. Development work's a bit different, though. Um, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, right? Sometimes that's important. Sometimes you gotta give a man a fish. He's starving, right? But teach a man a fish, feed him for a lifetime. That's what development work is. It's the difference between the two. Development is giving an individual, a family, or an entire community what they need to move beyond dependency into self-sufficiency. For what it's worth, this is usually long-term work. Looks like educational programs, investment opportunities, home ownership, church planting, legal reform, job creation, financial counseling, mentorship programs. Uh, development, to be honest, is far more time consuming, far more complex. Uh, it's far more expensive over the long haul than relief, but its impact is deep because it doesn't just meet a temporary need, it can break generational chains when done right. Now, when it comes to development, again, lots of examples. Some of our best examples of this are our global partners. Uh, first, there's Never Thirst. Never Thirst uh, develops clean water projects like wells, bio sand filters, and takes them to the developing world. Clean water in a community can honestly change everything. And we continue in partnership with Never Thirst to get closer and closer to bringing clean water to the entire country of Uganda. 
Then there's uh, Earth Mission Asia. You see that picture, by the way? Go back to that picture. I was there for that picture. We dedicated that well. And do you see the man in the striped shirt with his hand raised in the middle? You see him? That's the pastor in that community who got to be the hero of that moment. Never thirst partners with church planners. And so it's the church planner that comes and says, I've, I've, I'm with this group. They love Jesus. I love Jesus. We love you. We want to bring this community clean water in the name of Jesus. Isn't that neat? He gets to be the hero. He gets all the credibility and the relational currency from that. That's what Never Thirst does. Then there's Earth Mission Asia. Uh, Earth Mission Asia uh, works in medical care and they also uh, develop doctors and engineers uh, to help in their, their clinics and their hospitals. We built a small clinic basically in the jungle at this point with Earth Mission Asia that serves about 370 patients a month. I literally just got an email over the course this last week with a story of a mother who came, um, she was giving birth to twin babies. She had already given birth to one in the village. The other one was stuck, and so they had to do an emergency C-section. And they said if it wasn't for our clinic there, that both the, ba- the second baby and the mother would have perished. Stories like this every day. And of course, they're also training up these medical workers and these engineers to run the clinics and the hospitals from the villages there. Again, they want the locals and the natives to be the heroes. Third great partner is World Impact. This is in fantastic development work. They work in the, the training and the education of urban pastors. Thanks to our partnership with World Impact, we were a part of training over 1,200 leaders in Kenya, 410 leaders in Bangladesh, and 155 leaders in Mexico to plant churches and also lead compassion initiatives in their communities. And uh, fourth, last but certainly not least, is Go Ministries. Go's in the business of empowering local leaders to make disciples. And thanks to Go, there's a church planning revival happening in the Dominican Republic right now. Really important to note here, by the way, as Christians, we think that evangelism and healthy churches is absolutely vital to development work. The studies prove it. Healthy churches transform communities profoundly because not only do they care for the poor, but they also eternally change human hearts power of Jesus. We are fortunate today to have the director of community development for Go with us, uh, Juan Casa del Valle. Uh, I'm going to invite Juan onto the stage right now. Would you give give Juan a hand? And I'm going to move to this side of the stage, Juan. So you got two beautiful kids that I don't want to give this flu to. Um, (laughs) Juan, just real quick, ma'am. Tell everybody just a little bit about Go and what you all do. Yeah, so uh, like Tyler said, my name is Juan Casal del Valle, uh, and I work for Go Ministries. Uh, Go Ministries has been around for 30 plus years. Uh, most of our work is done in the Caribbean, more specifically in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we, in simple terms, we empower local leaders to make disciples, and we do that through three main areas. We do that through medical, sports, and church planting. So talk to us about the importance of uh, community development work that you all are doing right now. So community development for us is huge. It's kind of, it's been in our DNA since we started. When you look back at one of our founding fathers, Ramon Gabriel, his story, if you guys will put up this picture here in a second, his story is really, really special and and really, really special to me. Uh, So he moved from a rural community into another, uh, at the time, rural community known as Oyule Camito. So picture uh, dirt roads, wooden huts like this, uh, no access to medical care, no access to drinking water, no access to schools. But he had one special tool. Uh, He was a young pastor, and he loved discipling and loving other individuals. And he fell in love with this community. So over time, what he did was the following. Uh, He reached out to the youth uh, through sports camps, basketball, um, baseball. He reached out and... Uh, met the medical needs of his neighbors through just small mobile clinics. He saw the great need for a school, like in the picture that you guys saw. So he started a school in his community. And over time, he built this great network of apprentices that not only helped uh, build out his community, but also plant churches all over the island. Now that community, 30 years later, it looks absolutely transformed mm-hmm. with paved roads, regular access to water, um, 
uh, medical care, schools, uh, thriving businesses, grocery stores, and a thriving church. And all of this uh, was made possible because that man believed in it. And that's the same concept that we want to take to all of our communities as we're, as we're planting churches is that level of transformation. Incredible, incredible. Tell us just one more story of, of life change that's going on in Go Ministries. So one story that, uh, that I think is really, really cool is the story of this man named Pablo Peralta. So Pablo Peralta was a man that had absolutely rejected the church altogether, uh, but God just continued to work in him, and he eventually moved into that very same community. Um, and at the time, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but he was actually squatting in a house uh, right by uh, right by the church. Mm. Literally him and his whole family were squatting and the church came alongside of him, discipled him, nurtured him, trained him up. And Pablo had a really, really big love for um, some of the most lost. Uh, people fighting addictions and people inside of prisons. Now a prison here is very much different from a prison in the Dominican Republic, let me tell you. Uh, but through that, he was able to go into those prisons and now over, over the years, Pablo has baptized over 900 inmates in the process. Amazing. To the point that even through the pandemic, when everything else shut down, the wardens continued to invite him back because they saw the power and the change that was happening in their inmates. And every single year, now other wardens are finding out about this very same impact done by this humble, quiet, calm man, but just speaks in volumes. And none of that would have been possible if it wasn't for all of those years prior, one man focusing on that community, pouring into his neighbors, discipling that, and then watching God just absolutely multiply all of those efforts along the way. Wow. Thanks, Juan. Thanks. Church, uh, would you do a favor? Do me a favor. Just like you're placing hands on Juan, we extend your arm out. And uh, right now, I'm just going to pray for him and go. God, thank you so much for the unique calling you've placed on everyone's heart in this room to serve your kingdom, the unique places of life and geographic places, uh, the unique gifts, spiritual gifts and competence and talents and passions that you've given all of us. Thank you for how you've wired Juan and the entire Go Ministries team, how you've given them a heart uh, to reach the people in the Caribbean and go beyond that, uh, to reach the poor, to develop communities, and to do it all in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless their work. You've been blessing their work. Continue to bless their work. They've been faithful with a little for years upon years. Give them more, and they will continue to be faithful. Uh, give my brother Juan vision for... Uh, for how to bring the gospel and how to bring the good news, how to bring both physical and spiritual life to different communities around the world and continue to, uh, to God, just make Jesus and his name uh, famous because of it. We want him to get all the glory because he is the one who deserves all the glory. We love you and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Juan. And one of my favorite parts of this series up to this point is to let you all just meet some of the leaders and partners that we have. Look, what makes us possible every year is the generosity of our church each Christmas. Uh, got a lot of new people here, so I'll just go ahead and remind you I have one Christmas wish every year, and that is this. I don't want a lot for Christmas, but there's just one thing that I need. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to no, get Here's my wish. I just want 100% of our people to give an above and beyond sacrificial donation to our Love the Ville Fund. Um, we ask for 100% participation. Our goal this year is probably unrealistic with inflation and financial uncertainty, but we're praying for, for $2 million. Um, so please prayerfully consider giving this year. Now this leads me to my second and final point. It's a great place to end today. Uh, we learn from the special attention of, of God to the poor the Christmas story and throughout scripture, one, that to be godly is to give special attention to the poor, but two, we also learn that to be gods is to recognize our own spiritual poverty. 
And this is one of the advantages of spending time with the poor. If you're wealthy at all, you have so many things in your life that make you believe you got things under your control. This is why you must serve the poor. Because when we draw near to the poor, they evangelize us. Think about it. They have a firmer grip on the fact that life is too big and too hard to do it alone. They may not have the money you have or a degree like you have or the clout that you have, but what they do have is a wholehearted trust that is only by the grace of God that there is breath in their lungs today and it is only by the grace of God that they will survive unto tomorrow. Like the poor remind us that having a relationship with God is going on welfare. Think about it. It's unearned and undeserved blessing. Look at the homeless man. Look at the woman with no rights. Look at the the prisoner in chains. Look at the man in the gutter. Look at how he begs, how he shivers, how he smells, how he has no resources. Look at how he is broken and has nothing to offer. That's exactly how the Lord of the universe sees you spiritually and me. But yet he empties his riches and lavishes them on you anyways. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 Paul says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty he can make you rich. Look, the more you hang with the poor, the more you see this, the more you will be blessed by the depth and intimacy of their relationship with God. If faith is simply trusting in Jesus, they got faith in spades compared to us. Because we place our faith in our savings accounts. We place our faith in our good works. We place our faith in our own reputation, but they place their faith in him. So every Christmas is a reminder to us. God chooses the poor. The question for us today is this, will you choose the poor with God? And will you acknowledge you are poor without him? John. Thanks, Tyler. It's with that challenge that I get the opportunity to celebrate your faithfulness in our generosity today. If you would like to give to our Love the Ville offering today with physical cash or a check, you can do so in our lobby at our drop-off bins or continue to give online or through the app. There's an amazing story uh, because of your generosity that has allowed a small but mighty group to partner with Go Ministries over fall break where four amazing people took time to go and serve with Go Ministries. We got a couple photos to thumb through here. This team was uh, phenomenal. They were able to work alongside uh, some of the local partners and doing some of their construction projects, some concrete work, and then playing and hanging out with those kids so that they could know and experience a taste of the goodness of our Father and love of Jesus. One of the most dynamic things within this group that I find most joyful is that we had a father-son duo that took time over their fall break to spend time in the DR together and serve in the name of Jesus. I got two quotes that I want to read for you today. The first is of Sean, the boy, uh, his son. He says, my Dominican Republic trip with Go Ministries was amazing. I've never done anything like it. Going out of my comfort zone and seeing how God is impacting communities throughout the world was eye-opening to say the least. I built new relationships with lots of people through God, which truly made it all a great experience. And his father said this, one of the main reasons I chose this trip to the Dominican Republic was so Sean and I could serve together. We spent seven days sharing God's love and being the hands and feet of Jesus to people we had just met in a place we had never been before. Seeing Sean fully engage his faith and cheerfully give of himself was an incredible experience for me. There is nothing more fulfilling than seeing firsthand God at work through one of your children. Amen. If you're interested in learning about what it would take to go on a mission trip and serve along Go Ministries, we're actually taking six trips next year. And Madison Atkinson will be inside of our lobby at our kiosk willing to help share the dates and answer any questions you guys might have. Quick shout out and maybe a swift kick to the pants. We've got 17 kids in our youth ministry in high school that have said, you know what, I don't know where I'm coming up with the money, but I'm going to be faithful to the calling in Jesus and go and serve Go Ministries in the Dominican Republic next summer. So kudos to you guys. I'm excited for that. (laughs) 
With that, I want to give you guys a simple reminder on your way out. Don't forget to grab your Christmas card invitation to invite somebody to one of our Christmas Eve services and let them know what service you're going to. If you'd like to talk to a pastor about prayer or maybe a life circumstance that you need guidance in, we'd be happy to do that in our fireside room. And you may have noticed our lobby is starting to take form to look a little different. We've got Christmas trees popping up. Our kiosks have moved. Our amazing cross that is a, a beautiful art piece has been taken off the wall. No worries. It is only being moved, not removed. It'll be back up here in the weeks to come. With that, guys, I love you, and you should go and love the bill this week. We'll see you.